Welcome to Staying Connected, a podcast where I talk to people about their stories with VEDS, Marfan, Lois Dietz, and related vascular and aortic connective tissue conditions. This is your host, Katie, and before we get into the show, I want to remind you that the views, information, and opinions in this podcast are those of the individuals involved, and the information presented does not constitute medical or other professional advice or services. Any opinions that I express in this podcast are my own and not of my employer. In this episode of Staying Connected, we're going to talk to Peter Donato, who is diagnosed with Lois Dietz syndrome, or LDS, in fifth grade and has been super involved in the community and the team program at the Marfan Foundation. Before we go over to the interview with Peter, if you want to be on this podcast, I'm currently recording interviews for the fall season of the show, and recording slots are closing soon. To share your story on Staying Connected this season, visit the link in the episode show notes to get on the pre-interview schedule. And if you want to support Staying Connected and help it continue to reach people who need to hear it, you can join my Patreon for just a few dollars a month. As always, I want to say thank you to everyone who has been supporting the show. I really couldn't do it without your support. Thank you, thank you, thank you. My top tier patrons are listed in the episode show notes. Stick around at the end of the show for a preview of the next episode and some information about upcoming events. Hey, Peter, thank you so much for coming onto the podcast and sharing your story with Lois Dietz syndrome or LDS. I would love for you to introduce yourself to everybody who doesn't know you. Yeah, thank you for having me. My name is Peter Donato. I have Lois Dietz syndrome. I currently live in Boston, Massachusetts, and I was diagnosed with Lois Dietz almost 18 years ago. 18 years ago. So Lois Dietz, I know, is like a, it's somewhat newer of a diagnosis, especially from Marfan syndrome, and I think from VEDS too. Will you want to define Lois Dietz before we jump into how you were diagnosed with that? Yeah, so I'll I'll do the best I can. So Lois Dietz is actually, there's a lot of similarities between LDS and VEDS in terms of one of the main focuses of Lois Dietz is it's not just the aorta and the aortic root. It's aneurysms from head to pelvis and everywhere in between. There's also a lot of skeletal features in Lois Dietz, narrow face, eyes, and all and all that. Um, and along with Marfan, tall, lanky, flexible, that you would see in Marfan and hypermobile EDS. So kind of a little bit of everything for it, but um, yeah. Yeah, and I think that they've... You know, through my involvement historically with the Marfan Foundation and the VEDS movement and kind of learning about low East seats in that kind of way, um, there's some like GI involvement, too, that seems to overlap with VEDS as well, right? Yeah, for some people. For some people, yeah. there, you know, there is GI involvement. There's, I know, a few people have some pulmonary stuff also with their lungs. So, you know. Kind of, uh, unfortunately, with connective tissue disorders, as you know, kind of every system gets involved for people. So how were you diagnosed with that? When I was little, like two or three years old, my mom, don't know how she discovered Marfan, thought I had Marfan. So for the next six or seven years, we went to specialists all over Boston and they all told her no. He doesn't have Marfan, you're crazy. You know, he doesn't have Marfan. So in 2000, I want to say like maybe 2004, 2005, the Marfan Connective Tissue Clinic at Boston Children's Hospital opened. And she was like, all right, if they tell me no, it's a no. But if they tell me yes, it moves where we need to be for care. So went in, met with a geneticist, had a couple appointments going back and forth. And the day they were going to test me for Marfan, the geneticist is like, okay, there's a new condition, relatively new, it was somewhere within a year of um, being written. There's a new condition called Wozdietz. And Peter fits this mold a little better than the Marfan mold. So we're going to test him first for Wozdietz. And if this comes back negative, we'll test him for Marfan, and then we'll just run down the line. Because he has a connective tissue disorder. Now we play the game of what? So. 
got tested for uh, Woz Beats that day. And because it was so new, my results also got sent to Johns Hopkins, where Dr. Hal Dietz also took a look at them and he gave the uh, signature of, yep, he's got Woz Beats. So, and how old were you at this point? I was in fifth grade, so I was probably 10 or 11. Did you understand no. what was going on? Or like, how much did you know at this point? Not a whole lot. Um, it was through that that I realized that I hate needles and blood draws. But outside of that, you know, I really didn't, you know, know much. I really didn't understand much. I was in the room for every appointment, but still... A lot of that medical talk is going over a 10 year old's head. Yeah. You know, so. I want to say I'm super impressed that your mom like recognized that something was going on and kept pushing. I think it's really hard to keep pushing sometimes when there's doctors telling yeah. you that you're crazy. <laughs> oh, yeah. Um, I, I really am very impressed with your mom to keep pushing. And then for like how kind of serendipitous for Lowy seat syndrome to have been discovered before yeah. that appointment and that doctor to have known about it and tested you for the right thing. Um, yeah. At what point did you understand that you had Lowy seats or something? So I was in fifth grade when I got diagnosed. So the following summer, so summer 2006 was my first Marfan Foundation conference in Philly. And after that is when things started picking up uh, in terms of, all right, they, my parents learned a lot at the conference. So it's like, all right, we need an orthopedist. We need an orthopedic surgeon. We need this. We need that. So like, all right. And it was during those roughly two years until the next conference I went to was when I started figuring out what everything was. Mm -hmm. And by the time 2008 rolled around the conference and when I knew what Marfan was and I knew I didn't have Marfan, I had what it needs. What did that feel like for you? I mean, there's um, one of my favorite stories from 2008 conference. My second conference was actually here in Boston. And I met a lot of great people and well, friends with a lot of people. But I got out of a car and there was a, a seven foot guy from Vermont who happened to just be outside. And I remember looking at him and going, Marfan. And he just goes, yep. And I gave him a hug. And it was in that moment where I realized, all right, this is what, you know, it was that weekend where I kind of figured out like, all right, I have a connective tissue disorder. Now let's figure out what we can do with it. Yeah. And did you meet other kids at that point? Oh yeah. I met so many teens, kids, adults that weekend, a lot of whom I'm still very good friends with and very close with. Um, and yeah. So I know you've been involved with the foundation for more than 17 years. And I'm guessing yeah. that that was like, that was the beginning of this. Yeah. So how has your involvement with conference, with foundation, with like other people, with Marfan and Louis Steeds and now Veds, like how has that evolved over the last 17 years? So we'll backtrack a little bit, back to Philly 2006 at conference. I didn't really think of it. I, Really didn't think of it as anything like, okay, I got to wear the same matching t-shirt as every other teen and kid here for a field trip on the Delaware River on a duck boat. And I haven't seen my parents in five hours, but I never really put everything together that of what it was. Like I made, you know, some good friends there, people who I still talk with, but it never really clicked in Philly. And then obviously in Boston, you know, is when I kind of figured it out. And from then on, it's grown. In 2010, I was on the Living Successfully panel at a conference. So I gave my story to the attendees in Houston. And I want to say that winter, I joined the inaugural team council as a team. So helping plan the team portion of conferences, of the, of the annual conferences. So I did that for two or three years, joined the Young Adult Council, same idea, just with the young adults, did some stuff here in New England and Boston. And that's kind of gotten me on volunteer committees, volunteer councils. And now I run the team program. And I also sit on the board for the Lois Eats Syndrome Foundation. So it's kind of 
So it's, it's grown. It's definitely, if you had told me in 2006, Hey, in 17 years, you're going to be running the team program for this foundation. I probably looked at, probably would have looked at you like you had three heads. <laughs> what has that experience been like for you? What has been your favorite part? It's a lot of fun. You know, I run the team council and team program with one of my best friends, Dominga, who I met in Boston in 2008. So it's a lot of fun to be able to run that program with her, a program that we grew up in, um, and be able to watch these teams with meds, with voices, with Marfan, with everything, be able to watch them have the same experience, make friends that we did so many years ago. So yeah. it's a lot of fun. It's definitely rewarding. Um, and it's a good time. That's awesome. I love that you do that. And I am so impressed with the team program and I'm so excited, like as somebody with vets that, you know, teens with vets are part of that program now and getting involved with other teens with their same condition with a related condition like Marfan or Lowy Steets. It's just, I'm so excited to see like what 17 years looks like from now, you know, yeah. it's very exciting. Um, and I'm, so happy that you're like i just hear such just positive things about that team program and i know that you have a huge part to play with that so yeah, thank, you thank you for everything you do with that let's go back to your personal experience with Lois steeds so you know your mom knew that there was obviously something what kind of complications have you had with Lois steeds so in middle school when i was seeing my orthopedic surgeon, I, um, I had scoliosis. I still have scoliosis. And he figured out that my legs were growing at different rates. So in April of 2009, I had the growth plates in my right knee drilled out because that was, that leg was growing faster. So he wanted it to even itself out. So that was like the major orthopedic issue I've had, knock on wood, with scoliosis. I was in a back brace for a couple of years to try and slow the growth of the, of the curve of my spine. And then after high school, actually a month after I graduated, a little less than a month after I graduated high school, I had my aortic root replaced. And then in college, I had both my top and bottom jaws moved forward and hopes that it would help with my severe sleep apnea. Yeah. So for now, it's been mostly skeletal and cardiac, knock on wood. And yeah, that's where it's been for my experience. Yeah. So tell me about that aortic root replacement, because that sounds really terrifying. I was like, yeah. I know that's a really, really big deal. Yeah. So I went in for my routine cardiology appointment. I think it was after an MRI in February of 2013, went in and I knew I was close. I knew I was close to the magic number where they're like, all right, if you reach this number, we gotta have, you, you know, we gotta have surgery. As far as like size of the A or Yeah, as far as size of the root. Yeah. So the doctor walks in and he's like, where do you think you're at for your number? And I kind of guessed a couple of numbers that weren't the number, but were like a little bit below the number. <laughs> and he was like, no, you're, you're there. It's time that we start, you know, it's time to start looking at doing this. So we talked with him about it. We ended up going back there like next week. My dad had work that day. So he came the following week. So it was me and both my parents just talking it out, looking at, you know, who, who would he recommend to do the surgery? You know, is it go down to Baltimore? Is it, you know, are there people up here in Boston that he would recommend? So he gave us some names and we spent the next couple months, mind you, this is senior year of high school. So I'm also looking at colleges, trying to figure out where I want to go to school. Like, and I was managing uh, boys basketball and girls softball in high school too. So I'm also doing that. So I also got sports. I'm academics. Where did, everything is going. So over the course of the next couple months, I was talking with various cardiac surgeons around the, around the city try to figure out, you know, all right, if this happens, what's your game plan? If the valve can't be saved, what's your game plan for this? You know, just trying to figure out the best course of action. Also talking with other 
people who have had the surgery, other parents whose kids have had the surgery, other kids who have had the surgery, you know, just trying to get different aspects like what should we be asking these surgeons? And so over the course of a couple of months, also, I started telling small certain people, like I told my high school principal, I told my guidance counselor, you know, and a few friends and stuff like that. And then I graduated high school at the end of May. And three weeks later, almost four weeks later, I was in the OR for heart surgery. And then two and a half months later, I was starting college. So it was a busy, it was a busy, I was busy for a while. <laughs> <laughs> that is a really light way to put it. <laughs> yeah, just a little bit. What was that experience like as an 18 year old, like having, having that kind of surgery? I mean, it sounds good that you had other people to talk to that had been through yeah. it, but it still seems very scary to go through. Yeah. I mean, it was hectic, um, leading up to it. Like I had surgery on a Wednesday. So yeah, surgery was on a Wednesday, Monday and Tuesday. I was at college orientation. So I was doing college orientation and then went home and then 12 hours later, I'm being wheeled back on, on a gurney. So like just, I kept myself busy for those four or five, five months. I, it was obviously like when I'm in the doc, when I'm in the car on the way to the doctors, when I'm at the doctor's office, it's all right, we're game planning for surgery. But when I'm at school, I'm focused on academics. When I'm, when I was on the bench with my teammates, I was focused on the game. I was focused on the court, on the field. You know, like I just kept myself busy all the way up until that day. Like I just made sure that I had my mind elsewhere. Because I knew if I put my mind, if I gave myself time to think about it, my mind was, I was going to spiral. Like I was just start panicking and be like, oh my gosh, I mean, I'm going to have this big surgery. You're like, oh my gosh. But I just kept myself busy until, until that, until that morning. Yeah. Did the surgery go smoothly? Yeah, it went well. The doctors had, the doctors and my parents had some trouble waking me up, but the uh, Boston Bruins were in the Stanley Cup and they were playing that night. So they turned on the TV and I was awake in five minutes um, after waking, after uh, turning on the hockey game. And I was in the hospital for four days. So, you know, but yeah, it was, it went well. And yeah, we were good. That's fantastic. Yeah. I want to talk about your love of sports because I think there's a lot of people that are probably listening to this thinking, wait, I thought you weren't supposed to do sports. Yeah. So tell me about your your involvement in sports and how that has kind of, how you've adapted that to life with Lowy Steed syndrome. Yeah. So prior to my diagnosis, I played soccer for four years with that because I wasn't good. Played Little League Baseball for six years. Quit that because I wasn't very good. Um, there's a theme here, by the way. Um, <laughs> and then I actually started playing basketball like the year after I got diagnosed. We had the okay for my doctor. Like, yeah, sure, go play basketball. It's your middle school basketball, go play it. So I played basketball for three years. And then when I got to high school, or right when I was starting high school, I knew going back to the magic number, I knew my aortic root had been growing. Mm -hmm. And me and a couple of friends who had been playing rec league basketball for the last three years, we're all going to the same high school. And we were joking like, all right, four times state championships, like, let's go. But in the back of my head, one day, I have no idea what triggered this. One day I was like, I don't want to be on a state title run and then have my doctor say, stop. But I also want to go on a title run with my friends. So how can I do that and not get told to stop and kill my mood? So I ended up asking the boys basketball coach, you know, hey, here's the deal. Can I do the scorebook for, for you guys? Absolutely. Let's do it. Have you ever done scorebook before? No. All right. Well, I'll teach you. And so... I did that for all four years of high school. And then junior year, the guidance counselor was also the head softball coach. And he was asking me like, oh, what do you do for extracurriculars? I told him I managed, I did the scorebook for the boys basketball. Oh, I could use someone like that for the softball team. Like, all right, I'll do it. I'll do softball. I don't know anything about softball, but I'll do it. He's like, I'll teach it. <laughs> so did that. And actually, when I was looking at colleges, I was talking with 
the basketball coach and the softball coach, like, hey, you need a manager? Like, I can do it. And in the weird turn of events, I ended up managing the women's basketball team in college for four years. So I just found a way to, I love sports. I grew up watching sports group. You know, I love sports that I never ever said. So I just found a way where I can still get that competitive itch out by sitting on the bench, screaming with my teammates and traveling across New England to all to basketball games, you know, and having a lot of fun doing it while also maintaining my health. That is such a creative solution to that problem. <laughs> like, yeah. I really, really love that. Um, it's, I don't, you know, I just like, so often we talk about sports and how we shouldn't be like doing really, really competitive sports. And it's either like you, you play or you don't play, but yeah. there is this other option that you found to be involved yeah. and still be like a really critical part of the team yeah. without being on the field. And also it's a matter of, I know my health. So I also in college, I did a little bit, I, I played ultimate Frisbee a little bit, you know, but I had it set with the group that, Hey, if I get tired, I'm subbing myself out. Like I'm not looking for approval here. I'm going to go sit down. Yeah. And senior year, I did a little bit of flag football, you know, intramural flag football and the same rules applied. I told my roommate and I told my teams, I'll play, but I'm only doing a position where there's not a risk of me getting tackled, even though it is flag football. But also if I sub myself out, I'm subbing myself out. Like there's not going to be a negotiation here. I'm going to sit down and everyone was fine with it. So for me, it was also a matter of, I know my body. So I know what I can do. Like I know I can run down a field to catch a Frisbee. I know I can do that. But also I know my limits. Like I know I can't play varsity college basketball, but I can be on the bench cheering and screaming with my teammates. And it sounds like you have really wonderful friends too that have been very supportive. How did oh, you yeah. find like friend making? Is it easy for you or did you have any challenges with that? At the start, middle school, it's tough to make friends no matter whether you have a condition or not. But um, getting to high school, you know, I made a lot of good friends in college also. I, have a, I had a lot of good friends. Still have a lot of good friends from college and from high school. And, you know, I always, I always joke around with people. I have like seven different ways I tell people I have low sneeze. They range from the super medical, I'm talking to a cardiac surgeon about what low sneeze is, to someone who probably has a very limited knowledge of anything outside of heart condition. And I'm also not quiet about it. So like all my friends know that's, uh, that I have a heart condition, that I've had heart surgery, I've had jaw surgery. So they all know, and it's just, and they're all aware, like that, hey, Peter falls over, we 911 should be on the phone. Yeah. So they know, and they're all super supportive of me. They all, you know, love that I volunteer for the foundation and do everything. So they're all super supportive and I'm forever grateful for that. That's awesome. That's awesome. I think a lot of kids, and you can probably speak a lot more to this than I can because you are very involved with the teens, but I think there is this sense of like, how do I tell somebody, do I tell somebody maybe this sense of like for some kids and teens, that know about their diagnosis, like maybe they don't want to share or they're afraid to, you know, they're afraid of being judged or made fun of all the things. What kind of advice do you give a kid or a teen that's going through that? So I don't walk around chanting, I have voice needs. It's more of a, if they ask, I'm not going to lie to them sort of thing. And it's essentially that like, Hey, you know, I got going for an MRI next week. Oh my gosh, is everything okay? Like, yeah, it's a routine checkup. I don't have to get a routine MRI. Why do you have to get a routine MRI? All right, story time. <laughs> it's, it's stuff like that. It's usually how I tell people is, you know, like, oh, why do your ribs stick out? All right, story time. Like I, I try to turn it into, even though it's not a joke, I try to turn it into like something fun, you know, like fun and jokey. Like, all right, story time. Like, here's the deal. Oh, that sounds super serious. Like, yeah, it is. But 
we're good. Don't worry. I'm still the same dude you've known for 20 years. Like we're all good. I like that. The story yeah. time. I think that's really cool. So do you have advice for somebody who's newly diagnosed with Lewy seed syndrome? Don't freak out. That's probably number one. Don't freak out. You're good. You know, you'll be fine. And also you're not alone. I've met a lot of people who are like, oh, I've never met anyone with Lois Needs. And just a reminder, you're not alone. In high school, when I was a freshman in high school, there was a senior in high school with Lois Needs. Mind you, I went to a high school of 300 kids. So wow. two kids, two out of 300 have a Lois Needs. The odds are not that, that good. And she had never met anyone until we bumped into each other and just happened to be talking about medical stuff. And it was like, wait a minute. <laughs> we're gonna still we're on the same boat here and she had never met anyone she's like oh you're not what i would expect like of seeing of what someone tells me hey i have always needs it's like well not everyone not everyone's the same you know everyone looks different acts different and treats their diagnosis differently you know i have always needs but i don't like to define what i do and where i go you know so it's just a matter of don't let Lois Beats define what you do. Follow doctor's orders. Don't just, don't, I'm not saying that. Like, do what you want to do, but within the doctor's orders. Yeah. Like, me and my doctor have an understanding. I know my body. I'm going to do what I can. And he's, all right. But if you do something, but if you do something ridiculous and hurt yourself, then we're going to, then we're going to have a long talk. And so just because you have Lois Beats and it's probably going to change a couple dreams, it's not going to, Kill the, it's not going to kill every dream that you can possibly have. You can find those different avenues to still do what you want to do. I like me. I love sports. I wanted to be a professional player when I grew up. Now, all right, that's not possible. But maybe I can find myself back on the bench, um, coaching or being a ref or an umpire or something like that in, in the future. Yeah. And where do you? So I love that. Um, like you're not alone. I think that that really speaks to the power of community and the community that is out there, out here with yeah. <laughs> these conditions. Um, where do you recommend that somebody listening to this find that community? Marfan.org, Marfan Foundation. And then from there, you can find, you know, the different divisions. You can find the Reds Movement. You can find the Lois Eat Syndrome Foundation. You can find, you know, all of that. And there's a good chance there's an event somewhere near you, whether it be a walk or victory, whether it be conference, whether it be, you know, whether it be a, a little connective tissue support meeting in person or online, making those connections is very important because some of my friends here, they don't understand the medical situation, but the friends I've made through the Marfan Foundation and the LDSF, you know, I can go to them and be like, Hey, look, not got an MRI next to me, like should be fine, but we're good. And having someone be like, Oh yeah, no, I completely understand what you're like. You should be fine. You're going in, you feel fine, but there's always that little part of your brain in the back of your head. It's like, all right, something is going to show up. And I call that scanxiety. Yeah, exactly. Scanxiety. <laughs> having that scanxiety and like, all right. Like having someone else who will understand, it's like, all right, we're good. We're good. And then someone after being like, we good. We're good. All right. Yeah. Great. That's wonderful. Yeah. If there was something that you wanted medical professionals to know about Lowy Steeds, kind of based on your experience with Lowy Steeds or your experience with the medical system with Lowy Steeds, really anything goes here, what would that be? I'm not in the textbook. I'm not in the journal. I'm me. Lois Dietz is in the journal. Lois Dietz is in the textbook. But that's not me. Some of it might be, but not all of it. So that's why I, whenever a doctor asks me, hey, do you mind if like these medical students come in and like take a look at you? Like, yes, absolutely. We're going to have a Q&A with the medical students after because I want them to see, oh, wait, we read about Lois Deeds and it sounds like super sad and super miserable. So we were expecting a super miserable 20 something to be sitting on, on the table. But we walk in and you've sassed the doctor three times in five minutes. 
this isn't what we were expecting. So it's changing that image of what you think you're going to walk into to be like, okay, everyone's different. And some people aren't moping around with their diagnosis. Some people are taking it by the horns and running with it. Yeah. Yeah, I love that. And I think part of that is because those images that you see in like the older medical journals are really, really severe and just like, I mean, I'm even thinking of this one, like it's a drawing, like it's an yeah. artist rendition. Of yeah, Louis arms Steve, wide, black of bar across the eyes. Yes. Yeah. yeah, and it's like so um, not human looking. No. So, so there's a, um, you might actually have heard of this. There's a nonprofit, Positive Exposure, run by Rick Giudotti, who started that nonprofit because when he looked up these medical conditions, they were all sad and pressing, essentially. But when he looked at the people who was actually in front of him, he's like, this doesn't match this. So it's kind of, so that's kind of the motto I've always taken when meeting medical professionals and medical students is that ain't me. And that's no one I know. No one I know is that. You know, everyone's happy. You know, a lot of people are happy. A lot of people, you know, are taking it by the horn, Marfan beds, hypermobile hours, EDS, like was these, you know, they're all taking it by the horns and making life, making their life what they can. So I kind of take a page out of a uh, Rick's book at positive exposure as to how I approach medical professionals. Yeah, I love that. That's a great plug for Rick too. I think I'm going to put his website in the, in the episode show notes along, of course, with the Lois Deed Syndrome Foundation and Marfan.org. But I remember having a great talk with Rick. I think it was on like a Facebook Live interview or something in 2020 <laughs> during the pandemic. Yeah. And he's just such a positive person. <laughs> like he, he brings such positivity. And the pictures that he takes are just so beautiful and they really capture this vibrancy that is missing from these textbook images and from these like artist renditions. Like I just, yeah. you know, they must list for the artist renditions. They must take like every single symptom that could possibly happen yep. and throw it into an image. And then it looks so different than what you see yeah. in the real world because not everybody has every piece yeah exactly you know it, you know the medical textbooks aren't the people you see running around at the annual conference they're not the people you talk with on a daily basis you know they're all they're human yeah thank you so much for coming on the show and sharing your story with Lois steeds i really really thank appreciate it yeah, thank you for having me katie yeah. Do you have like ways that people can get in touch with you? So, yeah. So I have social media. I can send it to you. It's for Twitter. It's at Peter Chip. And also you can find me on Facebook, probably commenting on something that the Mark Fan Foundation or always needs syndrome posted. Awesome. Perfect. I'll put that in the episode show notes. Thanks so much, Peter. Thank you, Katie. Thanks for listening to this episode of Staying Connected, featuring Peter Donato sharing his story with Lois Dietz. Coming up on September 23rd, the last episode of this season, we'll hear from Kristen St. John, whose daughter Marcy has vascular Ehlers-Danlos Syndrome, or VEDS. They did tell me it was a genetic disorder, but they said that there was no need to do genetic testing um, at that time because they said there was, with the hypermobile type, there was no marker for it in their wasn't really much they could do for it anyway, just had to manage like the symptoms. And at that time, we didn't know what Eller Soundless was. We didn't even know there were, there was more than one type, you know, so we were just taking our word for it. And we're like, okay. But that rheumatologist did say that we should go take her to hematology and get her tested too because of her uh, extensive bruising, just to make sure there wasn't anything going on there. So that led us to hematology and then they did all of their testing and found out we had, she has von Willebrand's as well. The uh, hematology doctor though that we saw was a very good doctor, he was very thorough. And he was the one, he was just looking her over and looking at her history and saying, 
I think there's more here than like what meets the eye. I really think that you should get her tested, like genetic tested. Don't forget to subscribe to Staying Connected on your podcast player so you don't miss this or any other future episodes. And if you want to share your story on this show, I'll include a link to that in the episode show notes. There are a number of upcoming events you can also participate in. The Marfan Foundation and its divisions, the Veds Movement, and the Lois Dietz Syndrome Foundation recently announced its programming for 2023 to 2024, which includes a number of walks that are starting in the fall. Walks that have been announced already are St. Louis on October 1st, Cleveland, Ohio on October 21st, Indianapolis on October 22nd, Nashville, Tennessee on November 4th, and of course, Houston, Texas on March 2nd. That's it for today. If you like this show, I hope you will consider sharing it with your friends on social media to raise awareness of these conditions. You can also support the production of this podcast by joining my Patreon. Thanks so much, and I'll see you soon.